When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Lord Jesus asked that question in chapter 18, verse 8 of St. Luke's Gospel. And so we may well ask it too. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? But surely we need to go further. In this time of doctrinal confusion, intellectual incoherence, and moral corruption in the church, especially among the clergy, including in the highest ranks, we must also ask, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith even in the church? St. Luke tells us that the Lord Jesus asked this question about faith immediately after he told his disciples in a parable that because of the struggles they would face, they should pray always and never lose heart. Pray always and never lose heart. That is a good place for us to start. Friends, we live in a time of great apostasy, of falling away from faith in the Lord Jesus and believe in his gospel, among clergy and religious no less than among the lay faithful. And so it is right of us to ask, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth or even in the church? And given the infernal chaos and strife and ruination in the church, we can also cry out with the prophet Habakkuk, How long, O Lord? But whatever difficulties we face today, we must also remember that from the very beginning, the church has struggled with heresy and schism and apostasy. And while the presenting symptoms of these problems change with time and place, the struggle is never ending, as we see in today's second lesson. For the past three weeks, we read at Sunday Mass from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, and today we move for four weeks to Paul's second letter to Timothy. If you have not yet done so, I encourage you to read both of Paul's letters to Timothy, which together are not seven pages in your Bible. Second Timothy begins with Paul's tender and personal words about Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois and the sincerity of their faith. The apostle then reminds Timothy of the debt of gratitude he owes to everyone who taught him to know, love, and serve the living God. And the same is true of us. We are all indebted for the gift of faith to our parents, grandparents, godparents, teachers, pastors, catechists, and those friends who are our companions on the way. There are no solitary Christians, and we each come to saving faith through the mediation of others who bear witness to Christ by their words and by their lives, and who then count on us to do the same. In this way, Paul bore witness to Christ for Timothy, and then encouraged Timothy to do the same for others. But in their case, the apostle transmitted to Timothy not just personal faith in Christ Jesus, but also the apostolic succession through which the gospel is proclaimed and the sacraments celebrated until the day of the Lord. And so Paul wrote to Bishop Timothy, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Recall that St. Paul wrote his letters to Timothy to help the young bishop refute false doctrine and to organize the life of the church at Ephesus. And this second letter was sent because Paul knew that Timothy was struggling mightily to fulfill these responsibilities. Moreover, Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy from a prison cell in Rome, where he was awaiting execution for being a witness to Jesus Christ. And so Paul was completely candid with Timothy about the cost of discipleship. Paul wrote, 
Do not be ashamed of testifying to our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but take your share of suffering for the gospel in the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of his purpose and the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago and now has manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, and therefore I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am sure that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Notice that in this passage, Paul speaks twice of shame. He tells Timothy not to be ashamed to bear witness to Christ, and then Paul adds that he is not ashamed to be in prison for bearing witness to Christ. Shame is a curious thing in human life. It is not a virtue in itself, and yet it is an indispensable guardian of the virtues. Shame helps us avoid words and deeds that are well, shameful. And shame also directs us toward virtue, at least by moving us away from things that truly are shameful, meaning things that are objectively not in keeping with human dignity and the divine law of love. But shame has nearly been banished in our time because our culture now asserts that almost nothing is in itself shameful if we desire it. How odd then that even as we have lost a sense of shame in both public and private, we have been plunged into a toxic brew of public shaming through social media and political coercion that we usually call the cancel culture. Except now the things that are targets of public shaming are usually not shameful things. The things that are too often targets of public shaming are Christianity and the moral code of the Bible. For example, try making a public statement in support of Christ the Lord being the only savior of the entire human race, or of the sacrament of holy matrimony as the divinely privileged place for authentic sexual friendship, or for the right of life, or for the right to life of unborn children. Make any of these claims and see how rapidly totalitarian relativism turns on you in a ferocious effort to make you ashamed and therefore silent. And so Paul's words to Timothy are especially important for us. Do not be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord, but take your share of suffering for the gospel in the power of God. And how are we to do this? By remembering that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. And more than that, we must hold fast to the deposit of faith given to the church to transmit without addition or subtraction until the last day. Or as Paul puts it to Timothy, follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. And that is the same Spirit given to us in our baptism and confirmation. Now any Christian who has ever attempted to live this way knows from experience how difficult it can be to stand fast and be faithful and guard the truth, especially when others try to shame us for doing so. And so it should console us that as we read in the gospel today, even the 12 had to ask the Lord Jesus, increase our faith. But then notice how the Savior responds, not with consoling words, but by telling them in effect to tighten their belts, to man up, and get to work. 
And when their labors are done and they have borne the heat of the day, all that remains for them and for us is to say with humility, we are unworthy servants and have done only our duty. In other words, we should not expect extra credit for bearing our share of hardship for the gospel, because to do so is an essential part of all Christian discipleship. Now, one might suppose that the heavy burden of bearing witness to Christ is why so many fall away from the faith. But Paul did not see it that way. In chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, the apostle wrote to the young bishop about the trials he would face in preaching the gospel and why he would find it so difficult to lead people to saving faith in Christ. Paul wrote, Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, fierce, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding the form of religion, but denying the power of it. Paul then explains that such men will never arrive at knowledge of the truth. Those who will not acknowledge and surrender their sins to the mercy of God will never believe the gospel, simply because in their self-absorption they do not want to know the truth and therefore be accountable for living the truth. And that is why we need to rekindle the gift of the Spirit in our own hearts, just as Timothy was encouraged to do by Paul. In explaining to Bishop Timothy why so many people are not faithful to the Lord, the Apostle Paul was describing the troubled church in Ephesus in the first century. But it sounds so very contemporary. And as it was 2,000 years ago, so it is still today. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth or even in the church? That we cannot know. But we can resolve today and every day of our lives to be grateful for the gift of faith and to live in fidelity to the promises of our baptism and the promises of our marriage or ordination. And then, without shame, we can strive to guard and transmit the truth that has been entrusted to us by grace through faith, the saving truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. 